This presentation is um, by John Richter from the Institute of Sustainable Energy Education, and his presentation is entitled Weaning U.S. Off Oil. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. So this is what I'm going to talk about. You can make a decision if this is still the talk you really want to be in. I hope you all decide yes. But um, I want to start with why would we want to quit oil, right? I mean, isn't oil wonderful stuff? I suspect with this audience that doesn't require too much enumeration, but I'll run over that quickly. And I'm going to talk about the last 30 years. What has happened to the solar and wind industries and the electric vehicle industries over the last 30 years? And, and the, the changes are just stunning. And then I'm going to look out, well, then I'm going to talk a little bit about EV challenges, right? So uh, having an electric vehicle is not quite the same as having a gasoline-powered vehicle, and some mitigation strategies for those. But then I'm going to look out over the next 30 years, having looked over the prior, and lay out a vision and said, what if we converted our entire fleet of automobiles to electric vehicles? And we provided all of that power from wind and solar energy. So that's a vision, right? Because you can't imagine something, you can't do it. But what would that cost? Because that's, that's kind of the remaining argument, right? Uh, when I started talking about renewable energy in 91, people would say, well, that doesn't really work. Well, that doesn't really scale. I mean, you can do it in your backyard, but you couldn't really see it. Well, that's all gone away, right? We, we, we know it works. We know it scales. The question now is, what's the cost? And so I'm going to do kind of a back of the envelope calculation and say, what would this vision actually cost us? And it's surprisingly affordable. Questions about the agenda? We've got a pretty small group here, so feel free to uh, interact all through it. I welcome that. Um, and um, some of you will be taking <coughs> notes. Myself, I'm a compulsive note taker. Um, but if you want a copy of the slides, I've got my email address at the end. Just send me an email. I'll give you a copy of the slides. So you don't have to like crazy try and get down every URL that appears on a page. All right? So why would we give up oil? Well, kind of the first most obvious thing is the global warming, right? We continue to pump more CO2 into the air. Uh, transportation is a large part of that. This is the graph of uh, CO2 concentration in the air as measured in Hawaii. Um, and you just see the steady upward trend, and we've now hit a concentration of CO2 in the air that's a 3 million year record. The Earth did have this much CO2 in the atmosphere in the past, 3 million years ago, and it was a lot hotter. Oil imports are expensive. So there's, the media has just been full of you know, how fracking has increased U.S. oil production and we're importing less than we have. And you know, If you compare now to 20 years ago, we're importing 7% less oil. But it's costing us three times as much money adjusted for inflation. This isn't the inflationary effect. We're spending through, what? Oil is more expensive. Oil was $20 a barrel for 15 years. Now it's $100 a barrel, despite this plenty that uh, fracking is supposedly bringing us. Oil is very expensive and it's a drain on our economy. And then there's the matter of international entanglements, right? So two-thirds of the world's known oil is in the Persian Gulf. And because our economy is utterly dependent on that supply, we have we, our country, has ringed the Persian Gulf with military bases. <laughs> We've been involved in repeated uh, Middle East wars, small and large. And if there wasn't any oil there, would we have bothered with any of that? I don't think so. And then there's the peak oil hypothesis, which is that uh, there's only so much oil in the ground. We found and drained out first the biggest, most easiest fields, and now we're getting into scarcer, harder to get out of the ground oil. Um, and at some point in the production that we can get, even employing all of these advanced uh, extraction techniques, we'll hit a peak and start declining. We'll have a big gap between demand and supply. And how would that show up in the world? Well. Economics 101, that will show up in increased pricing, which incidentally just happens to see be what we've seen. Well, what do we do with all this oil? Well, not surprisingly, uh, most of our oil is used in transportation. All those cars, trucks, and buses that we see on the road, um, there's a 
I'll see sometimes things about we need to build wind farms to, to get us off of you know, Middle East oil. Only 1% of our oil consumption goes to electric power production. That's just not how we make our electricity. Um, it's mostly how we get around. There's some used in commercial and residential, but mostly it's industrial uh, applications outside of transportation. It's the synthetic fibers industry, it's lubricants, <coughs> it's plastics, and there are you know, oil uh, boilers you know, that are used and burned, but predominantly transportation. And within the transportation sector, the majority of it is light vehicles and medium heavy duty trucks, right? It's a little bit for buses and a little bit for aircraft and for ships and for trains. Trains actually don't consume that much oil. They're incredibly efficient ways of moving uh, bulk cargo around. John, does, where does farm fit in, farm for agriculture? Well, that's a really good question. Um, and I'm not quite sure of the answer. So I have read that if you look at uh, agriculture specifically as an industry, it's about 5% of uh, oil consumption. Now, if you broaden that out and say, well, yeah, but that's <coughs> the farm, right? Mm -hmm. And then that goes to processing, and then that, you know, retail is actually a large consumer of energy, mm -hmm. but not necessarily particularly oil. Um, so all those, you know, refrigerated supermarkets we have are, are sucking up a lot of electrons. But uh, and a piece of the transportation is moving those goods around. Mm -hmm. So let's look at the last 30 years of renewable energy. Uh, wind power is uh, growing on a tear. This is data from uh, OEA. So this is the US uh, deployment of wind. On these light colored bars here, we have the cumulative capacity of the wind turbines installed in the United States. In these uh, colored bars, we've got for each quarter of the year, how, many additional, how much additional capacity was installed. Um, and you can see this, this growth, and I, I tried to look at, well, where were we 30 years ago? And that was kind of a hard statistic to come by, but um, the world had 30 megawatts of wind installed uh, 30 years ago. And today the United States has 60,000 megawatts. John, did you mean 300 megawatts or 30 megawatts? I'm sorry, 300. Okay, yeah. all right. Slide's right. Um, just a, a phenomenal growth across the last 30 years, improvements in technology. Uh, the wind turbines now are, are much larger and better at capturing the wind. And wind deployments have consistently exceeded expectations. So everyone likes to try and project into the future what the future is going to hold. Uh, making predictions is extremely difficult, especially ones regarding the future. Yeah, it's supposed to be fun. Um, so the Energy Information Administration, right, we, we've had some, some installation of wind power in 2001. They predicted it would kind of keep growing, but, but fairly flat, right? And they were wrong. It, it grew a lot faster. And so then back in 2005, they made another projection that it was going to kind of flatten out. And they were wrong, and it grew really fast. And in 2007, they did the same thing, right? Three times, you'd think they'd, they'd catch it. Now, finally, the fourth time, they said, well, you know, it's not going to keep following this. It'll grow fairly fast, but you know, not like it has. And they were wrong again. Um, <laughs> so the, the green line is is the, the graph of total installed wind capacity in gigawatts. You see, it's an exponential curve, and in part that's driven by policy, but in part that's driven by declining costs. So the uh, cents per kilowatt hour for production from wind has dropped from 1980, right, a little more than 30 years ago, but from 55 cents, right down to five cents, right? Somewhere between five and six cents is, is kind of the, the current figure. Um, that, that's an incredible decline in cost. It's made wind competitive with anything else. This is a uh, chart of the cost of generating electricity from different sources. So we have the different sources here, the levelized cost in dollars per megawatt hour, and then the bars represent you know, variation within that technology, right? It might depend on exactly how you implement it or where or that sort of thing. And we see that you know, solar thermal uh, generation is, is rather expensive, and offshore wind is uh, still kind of priced out of the market. Solar PV is, despite the declining cost, still rather expensive. What are we really competing with? Here's land-based wind, and the only thing that's in the ballpark potentially cheaper is natural gas-powered uh, combined cycle systems, and that's only because natural gas is really artificially cheap right now. It's not going to last. Wind is cheaper than geothermal. It's definitely cheaper than nuclear or coal or, or any of the other options. 
And the potential for wind is vast. This is important. If you're thinking about converting your energy infrastructure over to a new source, you better make sure the source is big enough, right? That, that's kind of job one. Um, if we just look at kind of the five uh, golden wind states here, they have the capacity to produce more electricity via wind power than our entire country consumes. So we don't have a scarcity of wind resource here. The resource is, is plenty big enough if we just have the will to tap it. Wind is growing here in Michigan. Uh, you all saw this uh, slide uh, this morning. Uh, this is installation of renewable energy systems in, in Michigan. The uh, blue bar here is wind. You can see we had the enormous leap when we passed uh, PA uh, 295. Uh, and it's continued to grow. Uh, this has been a, a great opportunity. The Michigan Public Service Commission does evaluations of this. <laughs> they publish information on the cost of these systems, right? And so when a wind developer builds a wind farm, they'll send, sign a 20-year power purchase agreement with one of the utilities and agree to sell them electricity from that wind farm for the next 20 years at a fixed, flat cost. So we know what this costs, right? And those people aren't dumb. They're making money as well, right? Um, Consumers, Ener uh, Consumers Energy had a proposal to build a new coal plant and they uh, did the analysis and they said that would cost something between $107 and $133 per megawatt hour that we as ratepayers would pay for the output of that coal-fired power plant over the next 40 years. Um, but meanwhile, we're signing wind-powered contracts here and now for $90 or even $67 per megawatt hour. So why would we build that coal plant, which is going to further pollute our air? Yes? Um, going back to the last slide, I'm just mm -hmm. trying to process all of that. Um, I know I'm running really fast. No, I, I'm and just I'm it's thinking fun. of North, was it this one? No, the one before that. North Dakota. I mean, the fact that it's it's glowing right now with all those cracks that both in that. Yes. And, and yet, yet. It, it would be, could be cheaper. I mean, it, I mean, in trying to process, like, why are we big? The the big the big hole up on on wind development in this you know very windy area is not many people live there. So now you have to build transmission towers to carry that power out to the population centers. And uh, another twenty slides. I'm going to talk about one of those. Um, but uh, there's a lot of wind development happening in Iowa. Right? I was one of the, the big wind development states. It's a little closer to population centers like Chicago. You get up to North Dakota, and there just really isn't a whole lot of demand but there. But we're talking pipelines from Alberta. Right. We're going to build pipelines from here to here, but we couldn't build transmission towers. Yeah. Meanwhile, we will frack. Well, that's another topic. I, I actually have another whole presentation on fracking. And, and there's whole clusters of counties in which every square foot of the, the sub-earth has been fracked. Oh my God. Entire counties. It, that's the scale of it is mind-blowing. But I'm sure that nothing we pump down there will ever get to the surface. <laughs> <laughs> when the Titanic was unsinkable. <laughs> Wind power costs are still dropping. So this is from the MTSC study of it. And they said that you know the prices that they're seeing on these 20-year power purchase agreements are in the realm of 50 to 59 dollars per megawatts, which is 10 percent cheaper than the cheapest ones they saw just three years ago. So that decline curve that we're seeing on the price trend is continuing. It hasn't flattened yet. Photovoltaics are growing extremely fast. Um, so this is uh, actually global uh, solar capacity. Uh, by region. So you see on the red line, that's the, the total world uh, installed 70 gigawatts of uh, photovoltaics. Um, but most of that's in Europe. That's the green line here, right? U.S., not so much. China, if we extend this one more year, they just, they just shot up. They installed uh, 12 to 14 gigawatts of photovoltaics just last year. Yeah, last year we ended up being at 100 gigawatts. The exponential curve keeps climbing, right? I mean, pick, this is 10, right? To get to 100, we got three more notches up here. Just moving over one more year, right? The curve is steep. This is the history. This is what we've been doing. We can keep doing this. Meanwhile, the cost of uh, photovoltaic panels has been dropping. Um, from back in the 80s, we were at $16 um, per watt, right, for the uh, modules dropping on a nice trend line that actually broke below that trend line in recent years, 
primarily due to the migration of production from uh, U the U.S. and Europe into China, um, but also because of the new, some of the new thin film technologies like uh, First Solar's cadmium telluride systems, uh, which produce PVs instead of in little pieces that have to be assembled into modules on giant rolls that are just cut up and attached. Um, photovoltaics are nearing parity, meaning that the cost of electricity from photovoltaics will equal the uh, current average cost of electricity from the grid. I say this with a grain of salt um, because I've been hearing that we're, you know, five years from that for 15 years. Um, I'm not sure the calculations were always quite honest, but we're certainly headed there. And grid electricity keeps getting more expensive and PV electricity keeps getting cheaper. Clearly the lines are going to cross. We can just argue about what date. Now let's go to electric vehicles. So what's the 30-year trend line on electric vehicles? You've got to be kidding. It's a non-question. 30 years ago, the only electric 15 years ago. The only electric vehicles were do-it-yourself conversions, right? Some people would take a, a pickup truck and, and build a rack and put a, a row of lead-acid batteries in there and, and replace the engine with an electric motor. And, you know, there were maybe dozens or a hundred or two of those done a year, right, by hobbyists. There was no commercial electric vehicle industry, at least nothing highway leading. Um, but in the last three years, we've seen dramatic growth. So this is all electrified cars. This is including hybrids. Right? So we've got <coughs> growth there, but we also have 100% electric cars, cars powered solely by batteries that plug into the grid, and plug-in hybrids, right, which have two drivetrains, a gasoline drivetrain and an electric drivetrain, and they can operate in either mode and switch off, um, most famously the, the Chevy Volt. These are all showing dramatic growth. This has been brought about primarily by policy. Can you talk about like where that power comes from and what the differential is? If they're, if they're bur burning coal two counties away to run that electric car, does it make sense? You're uh, 15 slides ahead of me. <laughs> I will answer that question. Okay. Um, so looking at this 30-year summary, uh, wind farms uh, moved from 243 megawatts to 60,000 megawatts. That's a 247-fold increase. And in fact, it's not even fair because I'm, well, no, that's, that one's good. PV sales from 21 megawatts to 36,000 megawatts, it's a 1,700-fold increase, right? Not 1,700 percent, 1,700 times. Plug-in hybrids, there weren't any, so I, I don't know, but we sold 49,000 of those last year. Battery-powered EVs in the U.S., maybe we've had 100 of the do-it-yourselfers or something, a 460-fold increase. Now, what if we were going to switch to all of our car production being electric vehicles? Well, we did 95,000 of those last year. If we wanted to move to our total production of about 15 million a year, that's 158 times. If you view that not with this history in mind, that sounds mind-boggling. What do you mean? We're going to increase production of electric vehicles 158 times what it is today? But we've done this with other large-scale industrial technologies, not computer chips, right, over the last 30 years. So I assert it's absolutely possible that we could do that in the next 30. Not necessarily that we will, but that we could. Now, we've had some energy policies that tried to address uh, vehicles in the past. So in 1993, we had the partnership for a new generation of vehicles. The government doled out grants to the auto companies to research highly efficient vehicles. The goal was to get an 80-mile-per-gallon sedan within the next 10 years. And after eight years and two and a half billion dollars of grants, they'd made some prototypes that were diesels, and they canceled the project because we had a new, sexier one to talk about. We were going to get hydrogen-powered freedom cars uh, via the permeable uh, membrane uh, fuel cells that were going to operate on hydrogen that we were going to produce. Well, God knows how we were going to do that. That didn't matter. We were no longer going to have to factor in the price of gasoline in our budgets or vacation <coughs> plans. So, so said Secretary of Energy Abraham, who was from Michigan, uh, back in 2002. Uh, okay, we've had 12 years to think about that. How many of you have hydrogen-powered fuel cell cars? <laughs> but, but you've seen them at the showrooms. <laughs> no. So the big um, 
two big policy uh, pushes in the, the vehicle industry right now. We have the CAFE standard, which had been flat uh, for a very long time. Um, and so the, the efficiency, uh, the miles per gallon of cars that automakers were, were forced by Washington calculation to sell was flat and now rising and continuing to rise um, across the, the following years, um, reaching a, a theoretical 54 miles per gallon in, in 2025. Uh, two warnings on this, uh, two grains of salt to take. One is that um, 54 miles per gallon per cafe doesn't mean the cars are actually getting that. There's all kinds of finagle factors uh, involved in there. And secondly, um, no one in the auto industry believes that they are really going to have to do that. Part of the CAFE law said that in 2017 they would do a uh, mid-program review in which they get to reconsider these goals and the auto industry is, will be lobbying fiercely on that uh, with the anticipation that they can get this watered down to a good extent. And frankly, I'm not sure what 54 mile per gallon fleet of vehicles would look like, right? That might really be very hard for them to achieve um, unless there's a lot of electrics averaged in with that. CAFE also has a very long lag time. Uh, the average vehicle lasts something like 15 or 17 years, depending on which expert I read. And so making the new cars that are manufactured meet a higher uh, fuel economy standard takes 15 years to work its way through the fleet of vehicles. And so we had an increase in mileage in our, our fleet uh, back then. It leveled out, and now we're projecting forward that you know, that'll increase further. But there's a long lag time because we're not going to just jump perfectly good cars because there's more efficient ones coming out, right? We're going to keep driving them until they're, they're worn out, uh, passing them off to lower income people as we go. Consequently, the um, EIA is estimating that our total energy used in transportation is on a declining trend and will continue to, to decline somewhat as the fuel economy of the cars improves and in fact, we're driving less. So uh, a lot of this decline here was really a result of the massive recession of 2008 and the corresponding reduction in employment levels because unemployed people drive less than employed people. But that's not really how I'd like to go about saving oil. <laughs> so looking at uh, modern EVs, right? So there were electric vehicles back at the turn of the century and internal combustion engines uh, drove them out of the market. Um, but over the past 25 years, this has been driven by uh, the California Air Resources Board and their requirement that if you're going to sell cars in California, a certain percentage of them must be electric vehicles. Uh, so this started in the 90s. Uh, there was a big push on that. We got some electric vehicles on the market. Uh, those laws were challenged in court and gradually uh, watered down until they became more or less meaningless. Uh, but during that period, we produced about 10,000 electric vehicles. Uh, most of them were not sold to uh, the end users. They were leased. And at the end of the leases, they were collected and destroyed, as well documented in the uh, documentary, Who Killed the Electric Car, right? Um, the auto companies did not want to have the responsibility for maintaining stocks of parts when there were so few of these cars made, right? It was perfectly rational. It, wasn't some evil intent, right? It was a perfectly rational decision uh, on their part. But we now have a new zero electric uh, vehicle uh, mandate out of the California Air Resource Board, and not just California. Um, when the Clean Air Act was passed, some states already had uh, emission controls. Uh, those uh, 15, they're called Section 177, states uh, have the option of having their own requirements as long as they are at least as stringent as the federal government's requirements. Seven states uh, in mostly New England have uh, signed on to join California and create one standard for uh, zero emission vehicles. And so those eight states combined amount to 23% of the entire vehicle market. So if you're an automaker and you want to sell cars in what is now a quarter of your entire uh, market, you're going to have to sell some electric vehicles. Um, the ZEV mandate is enormously complex. I thought I was going to give you all a wonderful little summary of it, and it was like reading IRS regulations. In fact, it was worse than that, because they invent so many uh, terminology. But, so there's a ZEV requirement, which looks really big, except a lot of it can be met simply by selling hybrids, which aren't really zero emission vehicles. 
Um, but in 2018, that changes, and while there's a ZEV requirement, part of which can be met with what are called transitional ZEVs, there's a portion that must be a true zero emission vehicle, right? So all the auto companies are tooling up to meet this. They want to keep selling cars, they're going to have to sell some electric cars. So let's talk about you know, electric cars, just get the basics underway here. There's really three different types of electric vehicle drivetrains and then maybe some variations within these. But there's the simple hybrid, right? And there's a whole bunch of those in the parking lot out here. Um, all of your energy comes from gasoline. That's, that's my definition of a simple hybrid, right? There's an electric drivetrain, but it's there to improve your fuel economy. Your energy's all coming from the fuel tank, right? But this was a marvelous development because it helped us design and improve electric drivetrains. Because up until then, electric drivetrains were either for locomotives or they were for golf carts, and nothing really in between. So this uh, had the engineers work on developing the drivetrains and particularly the battery systems necessary to uh, do hybrids are very similar in nature to what we need for pure electric vehicles. We have battery powered vehicles, right? These are also kind of simple to understand. All the energy comes from batteries. There's no fuel, you plug it into the grid, you charge up the batteries, you drive it. It's just electric propulsion. And then we have the more complicated plug-in hybrids, which are a mix of the two. So you have a gasoline engine and fuel tank and drivetrain, and you have uh, batteries. So it's like a simple hybrid, except usually the battery bank's a little bigger. And in fact, maybe exactly like the hybrid model with more batteries, except you have a plug. You have a charging port, you can plug it into the grid, so instead of charging those batteries off of the gasoline engine, you're charging the batteries from the grid. And you're driving some portion of your driving on electricity that came from the grid, it did not come from the gasoline engine. And so what you're burning in order to drive is not oil, it's 1% oil, right? Remember that diagram? And it's a bunch of coal and natural gas and nuclear, and it depends on what the grid is and the particular grid that you're plugging into. <coughs> Electric vehicle milestones. So really, uh, as far as I can see, the beginning of this, I'm scared to death Phil here is going to correct me along the way here. But the, uh, the Honda Insight hybrid intro in 1999, right, our first uh, really kind of modern highway legal mass produced system with an electric drivetrain, but it was a simple hybrid. Um, 2008, we made the jump into a all-electric vehicle with lithium-ion batteries, and it was sexy, and it was fast, and it was $100,000. <laughs> but it was a, a break-in, right? And a lot of the technologies we see in cars today started out in race cars or in high-luxury models, right? It takes uh, time for those those prices to come down, and eventually they become incorporated, right? There was a time when analog brakes were only in, in elite cars, right? Um, 2009, Mitsubishi released the uh, iMai I EV uh, in Japan, right? So a all-battery powered electric vehicle, uh, mass-produced uh, for consumption in, in Japan, and then next year the Nissan Leaf started being sold in the United States, right? This actually surprised me. I thought we would evolve from hybrids to plug-in hybrids to pure battery vehicles, and we really jumped right into these. And then the 2010, same year, the Chevy Volt plug-in hybrid. 2011, we got more EVs. The uh, most popular hit 10,000 units. I understand that's a US market of 15 million. So that's pretty small. That was a heck of a milestone from looking back just, say, 10 years earlier when all of them were hobbyist do-it-yourself vehicles. Um, uh, so we got the CARB mandate, the Tesla Model S, the Honda Fit, and the Toyota RAV4. Almost every vehicle manufacturer now has an electric vehicle. Why? Because they want to sell cars in California and the other seven states. Not because they necessarily think it's a good idea. I think a couple of them actually do think it's a good idea. And everyone else is meeting the mandate. Battery electric powered vehicles are low maintenance. I don't see this in the press very much. I, I used to see this back in the 80s, right? There's a host of parts it doesn't have, and they're the ones that you have to replace all the time. The air filter, the, the ignition coil, the spark plugs, the coolant, the uh, fan belt, and the 
fuel pump and the exhaust pipes and the exhaust control systems and the oil. Ooh, the oil and the oil filters and the pumps and the... You don't have any of this stuff. It's really simple. There's batteries, there's a controller, there's a motor. Now, what's the lifetime of an electric motor? How many of you have a refrigerator in your home? When's the last time the motor burnt out and you had to have uh, a drivetrain replacement on your, your refrigerator? It took eight years in my house. Eight years. Okay, that's pretty short. I think the average is more like 20. But <laughs> they're really reliable, right? Batteries, maybe not so much. So these are battery-powered EVs that are on the market today. Uh, the Nissan LEAF, which is the number one uh, seller. Uh, the Tesla Model S, which has certainly grabbed the, the attention of the motor world and, in fact, was an inspiration for the Chevy Volt. Uh, the Mitsubishi, and I threw on the Toyota RAV4 here because it's an SUV, right? It's not a uh, little like econo box, you know, getting me around. Commuter car, uh, it's an SUV. And, it, and it's funny because back in the earlier carb mandates, there was an electric Toyota RAV4, right? They brought it back after years of not producing it. Um, so these are the cars. We've got a list price. There's a $7,500 tax credit. That's dollar for dollar off your taxes. You reduce your tax bill um, off of these, which brings the price down. And I want to point out that, I mean, after the tax credit, the Mitsubishi is not an expensive car. So, you know, you hear a lot about the Tesla and how expensive it is, and not every EV is expensive. And in part, they might be selling these at a loss because they have to, or they're trying to build a market. I'm not quite sure, but you can buy one. Um, they have a limited range. They have long charging times. These are the challenges of electric vehicles. It's not quite like owning a gas car. What do you do after you've driven your Leaf 84 miles and you're not at home? Well, it's not that bad. If there's an electric outlet, you can plug it in and charge it slowly. These charge times are on a 240 volt uh, high speed you know, charger, right? You'll notice that the, um, the Tesla, which has a much greater range, also has a longer charging time. Not surprising, the battery bank's bigger. It's going to take longer to charge it, it's going to get you further. <coughs> Questions? Yes? Oh, the batteries are lithium though, right? Lithium ion, all of these, yes. Isn't there a limited supply of lithium? Is that going to be an issue? I don't know. There's a limited supply of any mineral in the earth, but we seem to have a surprising habit of finding more when we really need to. Um, and we haven't really been looking all that hard for lithium for all that long. I also expect that we'll see a high rate of recycling because it's a lot more expensive than lead. And we've already got 60% recycling on lead acid batteries. Yes, Phil? I can answer that. I thought, yes. <laughs> The batteries are actually living this story. Um, lithium is actually a fairly abundant material. Um, it's, Bolivia is one of the main sources of other locations in the world. Um, and the electric vehicle industry and all the related uh, components are really a fraction of the entire use of lithium. You know, we've heard of lithium for medical applications. Um, lithium is also used in the glass industry. About 40% of the world's lithium is used by the glass industry. Uh, she, it helps in the melt process. So there's a lot of uses for lithium besides making lithium batteries. And when you take a lithium cell, only 6% of that cell is actually comprised of lithium. The rest of it is plates, electrolytes, separators, case, etc. So, um, from, and you look at the, the lithium itself and you say, well, so why is it so expensive to make lithium batteries? Well, it's the processing that makes lithium battery expensive, not the lithium. Lithium is actually quite abundant and are finding more and more sources in the United States as well. Thank you. Is, it, is the Prius still a legal hard drive Uh, Not anymore. <laughs> I thought they switched. Yeah. So what about a plug-in hybrid? Plug-in hybrid solves a number of the issues with battery-powered vehicles. Your range limitations are not really a problem. Once your battery's dead, your gasoline engine takes over. Uh, if there isn't a charging station handy, well, you're running on gasoline. You don't have to charge. You'd like to. Um, your slow charge rate, well, again, you know, charge as much as you can. If you don't have time to get it fully charged, go ahead and drive out, and, you know, when it's dead again, it'll switch to gas. 
um, they do tend to cost more, right? It, they're intrinsically more complicated. You've got a gasoline drivetrain and an electric drivetrain, right? That's more weight and more parts and more complexity, kind of intrinsically. I, I don't think there's any way around that. Um, but it's a good solution for people who are going to have issues with that range limitation, right? Top selling plug-in hybrids, uh, the Toyota Prius, plug-in hybrid, right? So um, a lot of us have Priuses out here. I don't know if any of them are, are plug-ins, but I love the pictures. They got gas going on one side, electricity going on the other, right? You're fueling it up both ways. Um, Ford Fusion uh, Energy, uh, the Chevy Volt, um, and the uh, Ford C-Max, and the, the, there's a bunch more, right? Um, Pricing on these, I think, well, the tax credit varies. So the tax credit is based on the battery capacity of the system. So the EVs have large batteries. The plug-in hybrids had smaller battery banks. So the Volt, uh, the tax credit was actually designed to maximize for the Volt. Um, but the other ones have smaller battery banks. They don't get the full $7,500 credit. They're, they also have shorter ranges. So there's kind of a spectrum here, right? How much, how electric do you want your plug-in hybrid to be versus how gas-powered do you want it to be? Dealing with the battery limitations, first of all, most houses have more than one car. How many of you have only one car in your household? Oh my goodness, okay. Um, so that's a bigger problem for you. Um, <laughs> But if you, have multiple cars, <laughs> if you have multiple cars, right, surely one of them could be an electric and the other could even be a plug-in hybrid, right? You can't just say, well, yeah, I might want to drive really far once in a while, so I can't have an electric. Well, you know, if it's really once in a while, you can rent a car. Um, more charging stations, faster charge times would certainly help. Uh, better batteries with a greater range would help. But I think the coolest option here is battery swap outs. Charging batteries takes time. If you try and force the power into them faster, you generate more heat, you waste uh, energy, and you shorten the lifetime of the batteries. <coughs> so um, the Better Place company uh, founded in Israel started this idea where you would drive in your electric car and a thing that looks like an oil change, and then take your battery pack and drop it out of your car and stick a new battery pack in. You don't own your battery pack. You're leasing your battery pack and they can charge them slowly overnight, they can run diagnostics on them, they can do maintenance on them, they can replace bad cells, they can take good care of those batteries, and you have the joy of not having to wait for a four hour charge, you just replace your battery in seconds. And you're ready to go. It's like um, filling up at a gas station. No, actually it's even faster. So there's a, a fun video here where uh, Tesla, who is now deploying these in California for their Tesla cars, uh, has a guy at a gas pump filling up his car on one video, and then in the, uh, the demonstration room, they have a, char a battery replacement station. They replace the batteries on three Teslas in the time that the guy fills his gas tank. So that's kind of cute. What kind of, what kind of range does a Tesla get? So how often are you swapping batteries in and filling, as opposed to filling gas? So Tesla's got a range of 230 to 300 okay. miles, depending on, they actually have optional battery uh, packs. So when you buy the car, you can get the small, medium, or large battery pack for the uh, range that you desire and, and pay more money accordingly. Um, so they've got quite a range to begin with. Okay, so I have too many slides. Um, the uh, Pacific Northwest Laboratory did a study and they said, what if we replace all of our cars with plug-in hybrids? With a 33 mile range, uh, 13 uh, kilowatt hour battery pack. Now, an assumption they made that simplified the analysis was that every one of these cars was going to drive at least 33 miles every day and use the, the battery pack completely. So that probably overestimates uh, the, the impact of this. Um, but one of the interesting findings, and, and they were really focused on the impact of this on the grid, was that electricity prices would decline because the utilities are going to sell more electricity in larger volume at times when their power plants are idle, usually nighttime charging. This would actually drop the cost. It would displace uh, gasoline by six and a half million barrels uh, of equivalent per day. Um, I got more info in the next four slides are on this. Um, they said the United States as a whole, 84% of the cars, pickup trucks, and sport utility vehicles could be supported by the existing infrastructure. 
The grid can almost do this today. Um, the grid's designed to meet peak demand, usually uh, afternoon or early evening on hot summer days. The rest of the time it's underutilized. So if we're charging our electric vehicles uh, in the evening hours or even in the morning hours, there's capacity on the grid to do that. Um, this is a typical demand uh, chart for a uh, theoretical utility. Um, renewables and hydro run all the time. They produce some power. We fire up our fossil generation to meet the peak demand. And in, at night, in the wee hours of the morning, there's all kinds of idle power plant and transmission capacity sitting there that if we can fill in that valley with further demand, we actually make the utilities more efficient and reduce the cost of electricity while charging our cars. This was their impact on gasoline. So they said, uh, you know, if you look, transportation is using 13.8 uh, million barrels a day of oil. We've got these other uses that I talked about. <clears throat> this chunk of it is gasoline, and moving all plug-ins would cut all, most of that out. Right? So that was the, the finding of this study that I'm sure is a, a lot more depth uh, than what I'm capable of. But um, what about where that power is coming from. So this is going to your question. Uh, well, the impact on emissions, greenhouse gas emissions would fall by 27%. So you hear, oh, it's a coal-powered car. You're just putting the pollution somewhere else. Yes and no. Depends on which pollutant you're looking at. You are putting it somewhere else. But a 27% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, volatile organic compounds, 93% reduction, carbon monoxide, a 98% reduction. Nitrogen oxide is only a 31% redu reduction because power plants produce quite a bit of those as well. <laughs> Particulate matter uh, under 10 microns, which are a particular health concern, um, would actually increase 18% because power plants put out a lot of particulates, gasoline engines, not so much. And sulfur dioxide emissions would increase by 125% because coal is dirty. <coughs> I didn't think this was good enough. So that's why I came up with this vision. I said you need to reduce oil use. It's essential to the economy, national security, and the environment. Now, mass transit and high-speed rail are really important, but I don't know how to do an analysis of the impact of that. So let's just skip that idea. Um, and let's replace every car with a battery electric vehicle. Over 15 years, we'll ramp up production of the auto industry to replace all production from gasoline vehicles to electric vehicles. It's a little aggressive, but uh, let's go with that. And then another 15 years, we replace the existing fleet, right? We'll replace all the, the cars that we have now. Um, and then we're going to generate all of the electricity needed from this, for this, not from the power plants we have today, but from wind and solar power systems. Everybody got a, a picture of what that future would look like? Does that look like a good future? Do we like that? I like that. I like that a lot. But of course, it would be ridiculously expensive. We couldn't possibly afford such a thing. Well, let's take a look. <laughs> we spent a lot of money on things, um, not all of which we agree with. So the Iraq War was eight hundred and twenty billion dollars just in out-of-pocket expenses. Afghanistan was another seven hundred billion. The bank bailout—we're not even sure whether that was seven hundred billion or four thousand billion. Um, the federal budget—I put everything in billions, right? I avoided trillions just so that we can have everything in the same units, right? Federal budget's about uh, 3,600 billion a year, and defense funding is 860 billion of that, right? So here's some big numbers just to kind of get you in the mindset, because when you analyze and replacing the entire infrastructure of the transportation system, it is a little bit expensive, but not so much when you compare it to other things we are managing to afford. So how much electricity would we need? That's kind of a starting point. Um, we drive our vehicles 3 trillion miles a year. OK, that's 12 zeros. Um, electric vehicles, on an average, get 3 miles per <laughs> kilowatt hour. So you can all look at your electric bill and see how much you know, kilowatt hours you're using and you know, how many miles could you get out of that, right? So we need to add a trillion kilowatt hours a year of uh, generation. And today we're producing about 4 trillion kilowatt hours a year. So we've got to grow our electric generating capacity or, or replace existing plants by 25%. Uh, so we've moved from a grid that is currently 4% uh, wind and solar to a grid that's 24% wind and solar. Guys, did you see those exponential curves? We're already headed there, right? That does not require any major change from, from what we're doing. So how much would we need? Well, to generate a trillion kilowatt hours a year, we would need 336 gigawatts of wind turbines, which would cost about $650 billion. Just remember those other big numbers, right? $650 billion. Yeah, it's fairly, fairly large. If we did it with PVs, um, 
the capacity factor is lower. They don't generate all day and all night. About 529 gigawatts of PVs at the cost of $1,000 billion. And so I said, well, we probably need a mix. And I arbitrarily said, let's do 70% wind and 30% PVs for uh, 394 gigawatts of capacity and $772 billion. Big numbers, but OK. We'll need some transmission. If we're going to build giant utility scale wind farms and utility scale PV farms, we're going to need transmission for this. Um, and this is already underway. So uh, the ITC is pursuing uh, this Green Power Express. They're going to build transmission lines to move 12 gigawatts uh, of power uh, from those windy areas into Chicago and Minneapolis. It's going to cost 10 to $12 billion. So if I just rough that out and say moving a gigawatt, co uh, 12 gigawatts costs $12 billion, it's a billion dollars a gigawatt. So we're going to need $394 billion to build transmission for all this uh, new green power. Now that's probably an overestimate because that's a really long span of distance that they're running and particularly the PVs are going to be closer to home than that. But we're in the ballpark here, right? This is back of the envelope calculations. What are, what are trans million dollars a mile for a big transmission line? The big um, towers? Yeah, so uh, if you, I also correlated this with transmission costs, so I found some document for engineers estimating it. Basically, if you're going to put a transmission line through, it's something between one and four dollars a mile. Uh, one and four million dollars a mile, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, that'd be nice. Um, and so if you look at this one, right, it's 3,000 miles, it's four dollars a mile, but it's a really large capacity. So, yeah, it's in the right ballpark. Um, charging stations, we're going to need to charge all these cars, right? Um, Prices are all over the place, so I had a little trouble tracking this down. Home charging stations, we're going to need 200 million of those. Those are about 1,500 bucks installed, so I, I got good numbers on that. That's $300 billion. The public charging stations, I, I, I don't know. We've got 125,000 gas stations, so I said we're going to need four chargers per <coughs> gas station. Well, it probably won't be at a gas station, right? Uh, 20,000 apiece, that, that, that's only 10 billion. Um, so if I'm, if I'm wrong, you know, and we need four times as many, it really isn't going to throw off the numbers here. Um, not, not, not in the scale we're talking about. <coughs> and then the question is, well, how much more does an EV cost than a regular car? That was the hardest question to answer in doing this analysis. We're going to upgrade 250 million, or 200 million cars that they're replaced. Uh, I looked at a Ford Focus because they've got a gasoline version and an electric version. And the electric version is about $15,000 more. On the other hand, the I my EV is only twenty four thousand dollars. So if the electric premium is is fifteen thousand, that would suggest you could make a gas powered version for nine thousand. I don't think so. The problem is these are sale prices, right? And the companies are being forced to sell these cars and make some price that we'll buy them at, so they can sell all the rest of their cars. So I don't know if the market prices quite tell me that. I also looked around. They, the battery packs are costing twelve to fifteen thousand dollars, best as I can find out. It's a proprietary secret. Um, so I said, let's go with fifteen thousand. Fifteen thousand a car more for the electric vehicle than the standard gas vehicle. We're going to replace two hundred million of those. That's going to be three thousand billion dollars. That's the big number in this whole analysis, right? It's more than the wind, PVs, transmission, and chargers all added together. So this is this is the uh, the killer cost. But these are worst case costs, right? The costs of wind and solar energy have been dropping. They're continuing to drop. We know that's going to happen. EVs and chargers are in their very early stages of development. The, the volumes of production are fairly small. They're going to ramp up. We can expect manufacturing costs to decline as production ramps up, as most manufactured goods do. I would not be a bit surprised if 30 years hence an electric vehicle and inflation adjusted dollars is less than the cost of a gasoline powered car today. It's got a lot less parts. It's much simpler. The expensive thing is this battery pack. And there are so many people researching better ways to do that. I, I, I didn't have enough slides, right? But I've got a dozen headlines of this company and that company declaring massive breakthroughs, right? Yes? Both owners would tell you, if they were here in the room, they would tell you how much they save each month on gas. And, and repair and everything. And so, um, have you factored that in, like the comparison? If you've got $15,000, it's like getting the solar installation more up front, huh. but then what's its savings over time? 
Perfect. Nice segue into my next slide. Thank you very much. That, that to me is a sign that I've done the presentation just right is when the question is answered in the next slide, right? Um, so looking at all these costs together, right? Wind and PV generation, we said 70, 72 billion. We said a lifetime of 20 years. That's conservative. Wind turbines are warranty for 20 years, PVs for 30, right? Um, so that's 39 billion a year. And the transmission, figuring that's good for 30 years, 13 billion a year. Charging stations, even if they only last 10 years, it's 31 billion a year. The big killer here is the premium, uh, the vehicle premium, $3,000 billion. I said 10 years. Now, I just said cars last 15 years, right? But batteries don't. So I said 10 years, I don't know, $300 billion a year, $338 billion a year for uh, this over the next, well, different lifespans, right? But this is going to cost us. But we're putting gasoline in our cars today. That this environment, right, I've paid for that with the, the generation here. We're using $135 billion of gas in a year at the wholesale level, pre-taxes, it's $2.86 a gallon, that's $386 billion a year. So near as I can tell you a figure, at the current costs, which are all declining, conversion to an electric vehicle fleet will cost us about the same as building more gasoline cars and fueling them, never mind the cost of pollution on our health, the cost of, to the Pentagon of defending the oil supplies, the weakness of our nation, and the, all those other hard to quantify things. This isn't more expensive. It's about the same and probably cheaper as those prices drop. Yes? I say this tongue in cheek, but what would be the cost of fighting the oil lobby? <laughs> Double that. We're about to find out, right? So, so they're going to do battle on CAFE in 2017. They, they fought the previous car regulation and, and <coughs> killed it, and I'm sure they're going to fight this one too. We'll find out. So that's why I say this is a vision, not a plan, because a plan could require a way to actually get there. Well, good energy poly policy should be a plan. It shouldn't have to be a vision. Yes. It's not a can we all cheer for that? Woohoo! <laughs> yes. I keep saying cars, 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 cars. Yes. What about trucks? What about semis? What about motorcycles? We only have trucks at my house. Those are the five what slides I, I cut out. Um, because I can't pull five tons of horses with a car. Yes. Understood. Understood. And and I. <laughs> <laughs> we we have three trucks and motorcycles. I don't see Harley Davidson converting to electric. Ever. Actually, there are a lot of bikes that are electric. There are a lot like, of electric bikes. Do you see, yeah. less, like, actually. one of the number one producers, Harley Davidson? For, for no, doing? because there's no Zed requirement making what, it. <laughs> what diesel semi is going to convert to an electric? I think the diesel semi Are you going to be able to gonna, haul like that? I think the diesel semis are going to convert to natural, compressed natural gas. And, and that's how we'll approach that, along with trains and boats. Planes will still be flying on. Would it be doing that then with time. trucks too? Because doesn't electric lower like the ability you can haul? Like yeah, I can haul like my lawnmower no. on a trailer. Well, no. With a so car. let me let me. Yeah, locomotives are all electric power. Locomotives, they're, they're yeah. trains. So electric can move anything you want to move, right? It's more a question of you know how many batteries we're going to need in that thing to uh, to power that. But doesn't right? that just make it more expensive than having gasoline? because you have to pay to have that. And what about all the jobs that you lose? We have, I work for a company that has 36 companies in the world, and all of those parts you listed that aren't in electric cars, we make those. We employ about 2,500 people in a small factory, 2,500 times 36 throughout the world. That's a lot of jobs. They're gone. So at the risk of sounding rough, by that logic, we should not have switched from wagons to cars because the wagon makers were going to go out of business. The jobs will shift. The jobs, we're still making cars. We're just making different cars. We're still making parts, they're different parts. But all of those parts are already made by other companies. But they'll have to grow. Oh, they'll have to grow and there'll be new companies to start up to shift from 100,000 cars to 15 million. There's going to be a bunch of new companies and a bunch of growth in those companies. Transitions, major economic transition systems like this are rough on the labor market. I'm not going to sugarcoat that because you have people who have the wrong job skills when it changes, right? Diesel mechanics aren't, well, they still will. There'll be diesels around. Um, but it, suddenly you're going to have a bunch of people have to learn how to work on an electric drivetrain, right? And how to test out a battery system and identify the, the faulty cells and replace them. Technology changes are rough, but I, I just, I never buy the argument of we can't change technologies because people will become unemployed. 
we've changed all kinds of technologies, and people have become unemployed, but then there's new employment that's created as an offshoot of it. Yes? And I just wanted to add to that, that, that kind of adaptation, it's really coming down to whether that's a choice that companies and people are going to make or whether they're going to be forced to for other reasons. You know, the change is going to happen yes. one way or the other, whether we choose to plan ahead or um, whether we find ourselves in a position of utter despair and, and are forced to choose a, a failure much more plan is a plan to fail, right? Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, we, 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 do you remember the unemployment of the Arab oil embargo? Okay, some of you aren't old enough. Um, but, you know, it, it was severe, uh, the, the unemployment of the, the last recession. I mean, you have to plan, you know, for the future. Yes? Uh, trains are relatively inexpensive per ton of money. Per mile. Why haven't we shifted more of the semis, long distance semis off the roads to trains and come up with an efficient way to load and unload them near I'm the I'm not an expert on that. I've read a little bit about it, and uh, a lot of it comes down to the, the railroads don't seem to be able to deliver cargoes on a reliable time schedule. I'm not sure why, but that seems to be a challenge, right? And so stuff is getting put on trucks that could have been put on a train, but the truck, they know when it's going to get there, and the train seems to quite often not get there on the schedule. Trains don't go it. They don't go yeah, door to door. door. They don't go door to door. That, right. yeah, and right. then that's, that, the, that's true, the tail end of it. But I mean, we're yeah. putting stuff in trucks to take it from California to New York. Why isn't that on a train? Yeah, UPS sure. does it. I mean, airplanes and... The small trucks. And, and I am really running out of time, so I want to do my last slide. Um, so our massive use of oil is dangerous to the economy, the national security, and the environment. And the future costs and availability of oil are uncertain at best. Over the past 30 years, solar and wind have shown fantastic growth and plunging costs. Electric vehicles have gone from do-it-yourself to mass production. Installing thousands of refueling stations of some sort that is acceptable to the drivers are going to be key to EV adoption, right? Until we do that, you're limited to the range from your garage to wherever you're going and back again. And there's a niche of the market you can do that way, but you're not going to do a wholesale um, replacement. EVs offer us freedom from oil if we make the investment, but the investment will pay for itself. All right. Um, if you want a copy of this, just drop me an email at this address and I'll send you a copy. I will take questions. I will stay here as long as you want to, but I think the next thing is yes. beginning so, or begun. Or so the, the, the next session will be in the auditorium and it starts at 3.15. <coughs> um, thank you, John, for your presentation. People will be getting up and leaving, but if you want to ask questions.